Um, all right, hey, thank you very much, everyone. Thanks for waiting for me. And sorry about that. Um, I don't think it's going to be worth the wait, but I think it'll be slightly nice to see some pictures as well. So thanks for bearing with me. Um, I get started. Addressing members of Parliament and peers in his first major speech as head of state, Charles III recited lines from a Shakespeare play to honour his mother, Elizabeth II. Quoting Archbishop Cranmer in Henry VIII for All is True, he described the former queen as a pattern to all princes living. But did he in fact quote Shakespeare? The speech, which occurs in the final act, is a part of the play now typically assigned to Shakespeare's collaborator, John Fletcher, back that when it's not mentioned in most newspaper reports. Although the play became known as a collaborative venture in the 20th century, the elision of Fletcher has a long history. When Henry VIII was first printed in the 1623 folio, it bore no mark of any collaboration. It was included in three further 17th century folios, none of which go to Fletcher, and in the 18th century, it was frequently advertised as a solo Shakespeare play in single editions of its collected works. While the play was sometimes presented as doubtful or suspect, for much of its existence, it had been considered as Shakespeare's work alone. Shakespeare and Fletcher's other extant collaborative play, the subject of my talk today, has had a very different trajectory, even if it's ended up in the same place or a similar thing. The Two Noble Kinsmen is now also accepted as collaborative, and like Henry VIII, it is often disparaged for being collaborative. Reviews of modern productions of both plays often advance collaboration as a reason to perceive failures. Both are among the 21st century's least studied and performed Shakespeare plays. But while Henry VIII was included in the canon-defining folios of the 17th century and was consequently incorrectly identified as a solo play, the two noble Kinson was not printed in the 1623 or 1632 folios. It was printed instead, as you can see on the screen, in 1634, with a title page that advertised it as a Fletcher and Shakespeare collaboration. But despite this ostensibly correct attribution, the player's Shakespearean credentials remained in question. While the third folio of 1664 added seven plays not printed in previous Shakespeare folios, including Pericles, Shakespeare's collaboration with George Wilkins, the two noble kinsmen did not make the cut, and nor was the play printed as part of the fourth folio of 1685. Instead, the play appeared in the second edition, not the first, of the works of Beaumont and Fletcher in 1679. Fletcher and Shakespeare's The Two Noble Kinsmen became, by a process that is yet to receive full examination, a Beaumont and Fletcher play. While this attribution was not uncontested, and indeed was contradicted, of course, by the earliest print edition, it remained highly influential. It was not until the early 20th century that the play received wider, again, not entirely certain acknowledgement as a part of the Shakespeare canon. So in this paper, I want to try and think a bit more conservatively about what happens to the two noble kinsmen in print and how the legacy of folio publication affected later understandings of its authorship. First, I want to reconsider the play's exclusion from the first two Shakespeare folios and to push back on a wider held assumption about the publication of collaborative drama. Next, I examine the publishing strategy of Humphrey Mosley, who acquired the rights to play in the 1640s and set about reframing it as a Beaumont and Fletcher collaboration. And then finally, I want to address the play's inclusion in the 1679 second folio of Beaumont and Fletcher plays and consider the effect that this had on 18th and 19th century attitudes towards the play. So I'm interested both in how the play came to be categorized as a Beaumont and Fletcher collaboration, what went on there and what this misattribution might tell us about Fletcher and Shakespeare's play. Gary Taylor and Rory Lachman follow convention in claiming that the omission of the two noble kinsmen from the first folio, Mr. Quote, can easily be explained by collaborative authorship that asserted on its first publication. Fletcher was still alive in 1623. Indeed, although he was never a sharer in the company, he occupied a similar position in the King's Men to the one Shakespeare had, in that he was unofficially at least the house dramatist. Hemings and Condell would surely have known that the, the two noble kinsmen was co-authored, and if this was a criterion for their selection of plays, 
then it makes sense that they would choose not to include it in their volume. But by the same logic, the folio compilers surely also knew that Henry VIII is a collaborative player. So the collaborative authorship of the two kinsmen is not, I think, quite as easy an explanation for the publishing history of the play as is sometimes assumed. While the precise reasons for the omission of the two noble kinsmen and the inclusion of Henry VIII remain unclear, the relative genre of the two plays and the authorial association of those genres seems a likely factor. As Emma Smith observes, the folio organization of plays into three genres is an emphatic element of its paradox on the title page, again on the list of actors, and in the catalog that lists two plays, which you can see on the screen. This was far from an inevitable way of organizing material. So the Ben Johnson folio, for example, offers no such categorization. Henry VIII was easily incorporated into the history category, the smallest of the three generic classifications, bumping up the section from nine texts to ten. The two noble kinsmen is um, a play that is arguably harder to categorize and may have been less immediately and easily amenable to the generic logic of the volume. Although it played occasionally classified as a tragedy in the 19th century, the play seems like this to have been incorporated into the comedy category and is often viewed as a tragic comedy by some distance the fullest of the three and perhaps therefore the least in the Bolson or the most in the pruning. And probably also helped that Shakespeare was very strongly associated with history plays, whereas Fletcher was not. So Henry VIII, I think, was more easily co opted as a solo play than the two noble kinsmen which, while congruent with Shakespeare's late writing career, may have seen more pace, or certainly as much a pace, with the work of Fletcher and his long-standing collaborator Beaumont, perhaps especially since it contained a reworked version of Beaumont's roughly contemporaneous Mask of the Inner Temple and Grey's Inn. If the folio compilers were agonizing about which plays to leave out, Peter Carroll reminds us that the volume makes no claims to completion of it then the two noble kinsmen may have seemed a good bet on generic as well as authorial terms. That William Davenant, on adapting the play in the restoration under the title The Rivals, instinctively cut most of the parts now attributed to Shakespeare, while in Michael Dobson's words, out Fletchering Fletcher by providing an unambiguous happy ending, suggests that 7th and century readers and audiences might have felt it fit at the Fletcher and better. When the play was finally printed in 1634, Perhaps, as Richard Proudfoot and Eric Rasmussen suggest, as a supplement to the second folio published two years earlier, it advertised collaboration in a way that then militated against its inclusion in the later Shakespeare folios. A comparison with Pericles, the sixth edition of which was printed in 1633, perhaps also as a second folio supplement, is instructive. Pericles was advertised as a solo Shakespeare play in all its earlier editions which arguably makes its exclusion from the early folios harder to fathom and grounds of collaboration. It seems that the text, rather than the status of the authorship, was the major obstacle. Its publication as a solo play, combined with the fact that Wilkins, unlike Fletcher, had little cachet as a playwright, meant that it was unlikely to have been swept up into the canon of another author. Heracles was ripe for inclusion in later folios and was added to the Shakespeare collection for the first time in 1664, the two noble kinsmen was not. If the court of attribution of the two noble kinsmen made it difficult for the play to be incorporated into later Shakespeare folios, it, it's, its acknowledgement of Fletcher, whose name's first on the title page, made easier its passage into the Fletcher canon and from there the more nebulous canon of Beaumont and Fletcher. The groundwork for the play's inclusion in a Beaumont and Fletcher folio, was prepared by the royalist publisher Humphrey Mosey, who had a strong interest in the publication of drama, and a keen awareness of how Fletcher, one of the century's most illustrious playwrights, might be packaged in a post-theatre ban, Civil War England, as a royalist dramatist from a great bygone era of theatrical activity. Mosey acquired the rights to publish the play in 1646, and over the course of the ne next decade, he sought to offload unsold copies of the 1634 editions. Book catalogues included in the back of several books printed in the 1640s and 1650s lists of two noble kinsmen as a Beaumont and Fletcher collaboration, making it clear that Mosley was explicitly recategorizing the play, even though the reader seeking to obtain a copy of the play seemingly would find Fletcher and Shakespeare rather than Beaumont and Fletcher on its title page. So here's one example of, of several. 
Um, here you can see that the two noble kinsmen is placed in a continuum with single editions of the elder brother, the scorned lady, the woman hater, Siri and Theodore, Cupid's Revenge, and Monsieur Thomas. Not all of these plays were Beaumont's Fletcher collaborations. So Fletcher collaborated with Philip Massinger, for example, in Thierry and Theodore, but Fletcher had a hand in them all. As I've discussed elsewhere, Beaumont and Fletcher had a long standing association, which was eminently marketable. And as a result, their plays were frequently advertised in printers' collaborations, even when their collaboration was uncertain. So The Knights of the Burning Castle, for example, was first printed as a Beaumont play in 1613, but was reassigned to Beaumont and Fletcher in the second edition of 1635. The strength of the Beaumont and Fletcher bond was such that for most at least, many us um, but for most, at least, uh, it overrode any appeal of the Fletcher and Shakespeare label used on the 1634 Two Noble Kings title page. When the play was transferred from the previous publisher, John Waterson, to Mosley on the 31st of October 1642, it was entered in the sacred register as a Fletcher solo play. But it made sense for Mosley to mark the play as a Beaumont and Fletcher collaboration rather than a Fletcher Shakespeare play or a solo Fletcher play, given the association of Beaumont and Fletcher in prior publications. And of course, around this time, Mosley is also preparing a 1647 publication. At some point, he's also weighing up whether that publication should contain only a uh, new published work, which is what eventually he did, which, excluded, which meant that the two noble prince has to be excluded, or whether to go for some bigger volume, including all Fletcher or Beaumont and Fletcher texts. But he didn't do that, he couldn't get hold of all of the texts for one reason. Jeffrey Master has noted that the 1634 quarto title page figured Fletcher and Shakespeare as both gentlemen and memorable worthies of their time, establishing a correspondence between the two noble kids and the two gentle playwrights. If this was part of the appeal of the play in print, then advertising it as a Beaumont and Fletcher play made even more sense. And it is the kind of thing that uh, Mosley is trying to do with the Beaumont and Fletcher folio. It's very nostalgic looking back to the pre Civil War era and so on. Within a year of acquiring the two noble kinsmen, Mosley uh, and Humphrey Robinson published this monumental folio of works never before published attributed to Beaumont and Fletcher. As a previously published play, the two noble kinsmen was effectively barred entry. But most of these book catalogues make clear that he was keen for readers to associate the play with Beaumont's collection. Had the play sold better, Mosley may have reprinted it, possibly with a new title page, as he had done with editions of The Woman Hater and Thierry and Jimbre, which had been printed in early editions without authorial attribution, and which he figured as Beaumont's and Fletcher plays. And again, even though one of them isn't actually strictly speaking a Beaumont's and Fletcher play. But as Zachary Lesser has explained, the first edition of the two noble kings flopped, largely as a result of marketing restrictions by the publisher. Mosley was apparently content then to try and sell unsold copies of the edition, but not minded to go to the financial and administrative effort of reprinting and remarketing the play. And at this point, it's something I haven't really factored into, into my paper. I kind of realized it like that. <laughs> Actually, I should probably talk about it. But, um, Mosley also um, acquired the rights to, to publish Cardenio, and of course he didn't publish it. Um, this is the, the other Fletcher and Shakespeare collaboration. He lists it in the statement's register as a Fletcher and Shakespeare play, um, not that he might have done a Beaumont and Fletcher play, but then he doesn't go on to, 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 to print it, so the play doesn't get to be known as either uh, a Shakespeare and Fletcher play in, in print or indeed as a Beaumont and Fletcher play. And I wonder what he would have done if he had printed it. And um, what he does with the two noble Kinsmen were um, it's entered um, to Fletcher, it's got um, Shakespeare and Fletcher in a title page, but he wants to recatalog it as um, a, a, a Beaumont and Fletcher play. So that's that possibly he might have done this had he, had he printed it, but of course he didn't and one never know. What we do know, though, is that most of these recategorization of the two noble kings seem to be catching on around this time. And this is evident, for example, from a catalogue appended to Andrew Crook's 1661 edition of Wit Without Money, a play attributed to Bones and Fletcher on its title page, which contained a list of 17 further quarter editions attributed to the authors. And here you can see just at the bottom, number 17 is uh, Noble Kinsman. This list of plays 
which, as Adam G. Hooks notes, was explicitly differentiating the text from the plays in the 1647 poem of the Spanish folio, includes the two noble kinsmen. Although the most catalogs show that the two noble kinsmen were some way frequently accepted as a bone of the Fletcher play, the 1634 edition remained the only version available in print for 45 years. So, unsurprisingly, there's ambiguity uh, about the play's attribution. What, what is interesting, though, is that the obvious and correct attribution that Fletcher and Fletcher were co authors, such as explicitly stating on the board for afterward, does not seem to have had that much traction. It's notable, for example, that while usually attributed to Beaumont and Fletcher, the play was sometimes categorized as a solo Shakespeare play, not as a, a, a Shakespeare and uh, Fletcher play. And you can see here uh, on, on the screen an example. This is from an exact and perfect catalog of all the plays that were ever printed, which is appended to the first edition of The Old Law, a play attributed by its title page to Massinger, Thomas Middleton, and William Rowley. Probably erroneously, the messenger doesn't seem to contribute to this conversation. The two noble kinsmen here then is listed as Shakespeare play. Curiously, so too actually was Middleton's uh, trick to catch the old one. I don't know what's going on there. Maybe a printing error, strange attribution fields, who knows? So it's not, in fact, an exact and perfect cattle at all. Um, on the other hand, the play was presented as a Fletcher solo play on occasion. As was the case in Francis Perkins' early restoration catalog, which promised to list all of the comedies, tragedies, phantom comedies, pastorals, masks, and interludes that were ever yet printed and published until this present year, 1661. And again, you can see this in a screen. In an advertisement to the reader, Kirkman attributes 52 plays to Beaumont's Fletcher. So he seems then, presumably for reasons of state, to have used the name Fletcher as a standard for Beaumont and Fletcher. So you can see here on that one, not just the three, but elsewhere in this catalogue, um, he, uh, he lists plays like The Maid's Tragedy and The Knights of the Pestle, which Fletcher, uh, sorry, which Beaumont clearly contributed to or wrote alone, and which were always advertised as Beaumont and uh, all Beaumont and Fletcher plays as simply Fletcher plays. I think it is instructive though that while the names Beaumont and Fletcher were tagged together, Fletcher's name had primacy here. He was, after all, canonized as part of the triumvirate of wit in, in the 1647 volume alongside Shakespeare and Johnson. And so, in a curious way, around this time, Fletcher is emerging as simultaneously deeply collaborative, backed up really intimately with, with this one particular writer, Francis Sowers, not so much with all the writers like uh, Shakespeare or uh, Philip Massinger, who is his biggest collaborator, but also identifiably singular. It's interesting, for example, that Kirkman's bookshop was heralded by a sign of John Fletcher's head, not Beaumont's Fletcher's head. Ultimately, then, the play's strong connection to Fletcher and Fletcher's emergence with Beaumont as a highly vendable commodity in the 17th century book trade seemingly contributed to its admission in the 1664 folio. If it's stated that the Beaumont and Fletcher play was not entirely secure, it seems, the 17th century publishers at least, to have been more closely aligned with Fletcher's Uber than with Shakespeare's. The Shakespeare folios always included Fletcher's work, but also suppressed information about collaboration in an effort to present Shakespeare as a singular and singularly talented author. As an explicitly advertised and collaborative play, as far as I know, the only one in the 17th century advertised as Shakespeare collaboration. The two noble kinsmen may have been an awkward case of the compilers of the third folio, who sought to introduce new plays and, in fact, largely introduced unlockable plays, but wanted to continue to market the material as Shakespeare's own work. It was not so much then that the two noble kinsmen was a collaborative play that was a problem, but that it was a flagrantly collaborative play, and that it was explicitly associated with another marketable playwright, Fletcher an intensive collaborative writer whose plays, including his solo drama, were routinely presented as a collaboration with Beaumont. So Fletcher doesn't pose any kind of obstacle uh, in this regard. The 1647 folio, unlike the earlier Johnson and Shakespeare volumes, made collaboration a selling point. So Beaumont and Fletcher can, therefore, exert a strong pull in the human of the King's so when Henry Perrin, Perrin, John Martin, and Richard Marriott, seeking to profit from the appeal of Beaumont's Fletcher plays and restoration, produced an ambitious second volume of the playwright's work in 1679, 
They think about not only reprinting the plays in the sixteen forty seven folio, but also at the now received most of one's hope to do, all of the known by one's hand for flesh plays. The Chinoble Kinson found its home here. The fact that its 1634 title page suggested that the play was Arch Shakespeare's was not a problem for a volume that played facts and loose with attribution. The 1679 folio helped enshrine the plays in the canon of Beaumont and Fletcher, at least for a time. The two noble kings appeared in subsequent editions, such as Thompson's collection of the works of Beaumont and Fletcher in the 18th century, and was absent from Shakespeare collections. Even if Alexander Pope suggested that Shakespeare may have had a great claim to the play, even in Fletcher. Shakespeare's co authorship of the play could still be stated. So, in a 1691 account of the early on the stage, uh, Gerard Langday noted that the play was written by Mr. Fletcher and Mr. Shakespeare. But the collaboration, if it was mentioned, was almost always figured in hazy and uncertain terms. Writing eight years later, Langday suddenly revised his account of the play's authorship. He wrote Mr. Shakespeare assisted in the writing of this play. Langdon's account allows the play to be more fleshless than Shakespeare's. The more senior playwright here is relegated to the supported world. The Shakespeare and Bowman's and Fletcher folios of the 17th century, by including or omitting the two noble kingdoms, went a long way towards determining the place of royal statements. But the two noble kingdoms has so much of its friend life found itself signed to the canon of Bowman and Fletcher, tells us something. About both Fletcher and Shakespeare. The play's explicit collaboration, sorry, the, the play's explicit collaborative claim acted as a deterrent to publishers seeking to prevent Shakespeare as a solo author, a position befitting a writer at various points in time, Louis Blue, that is full of the age, the national poets, and the world's dramatists. Fletcher, perhaps unique among early modern dramatists in his ability to seem both like a distinctive solo writer and an inherently collaborative one could easily accommodate the play in his hand onto the Beaumont of Fletcher heaven. The Fletcher was so heavily associated with Beaumont, in turn it hard fully to apprehend Shakespeare as a collaborator. Fletcher and Shakespeare, as two parts of the triangle of wits, were set up with rivals who represent different kinds of dramatic tradition, rather than as collaborators laboring towards a similar end. It will be centuries before what was splendidly declared on the title page of the play's first edition, Will become widely accepted, and even now, often uncertainly, apologetically, even regretfully. The Two Noble Kinsmen is no longer a Beaumont and Fletcher play, but in modern criticism and performance, it is not always a Fletcher and Shakespeare play either. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, well, um, uh, this very precise uh, delineation of the uh, Byways of uh, um, for this uh, collaborative play. Um, I think we uh, directly uh, now listen to our second speaker, Alison Lenne, who is a PhD candidate at Goethe University in Frankfurt, where she also received a master's degree in undergraduate literature, cultures, and media. Her current research is on Elizabethan and Jacobian history plays and the influence of formats from the development of cultural memories. And today, to address uh, another play, another another precisely, uh, Henry Deans of Scotland. Thank you for your introduction. This is on. It is okay. Good. Um, yeah, my my discussion really does step off of some of the questions that were started earlier about Henry VIII. So I'd like to begin really with the question of why was Henry VIII included in Shakespeare's folio? As many scholars have noted, structurally Henry VIII does not follow the conventions of other Shakespearean history plays, and it has resisted categorization. I would argue that the play demonstrates characters of the Fletcher's writing, especially in its structures and themes. So questioning why this play was printed alongside other English histories more confidently ascribed to Shakespeare raises several other important questions. There are four intertwined concepts that will discuss in exploring this question. Genre, the place of the player in the uh, company, authorship, and the differences in marketing plays for audiences or readers. 
So first, I want to start by discussing how Henry VIII presents a problem within the context of Shakespeare's histories and scholars who define them. And I would like to address how these arisen from two assumptions, Shakespeare as an author and the decline in popularity of the history play. While the assumption that Henry VIII does not follow the conventions of other history plays within Shakespeare's canon requires further reassessing, thematically, the play deals with political questions of monarchical authority and absolutism similar to many of Shakespeare's last plays. As authorship becomes less of a focus, the play has been reassessed with an eye for understanding how the play functions and its destruction of classical unity. Fletcher's influence is apparent in a play criticized for its lack of unity and its stirring support and common unrest. Gordon McMullen noted in his work on John Fletcher that Fletcher's plays often contain a five front of posture, resulting from regular collaboration and negotiation of personal and professional ties to those critical of James' book politics. This can be seen in how the play focuses the audience's attention on the often ironic political undercurrent which drives its characters towards their respective fates in a constant turning of fortune throughout the play, as well as its representation of unrest at every level of society. A more ironic reading of the play has been suggested in recent, recent, excuse me, recent scholarship. This scholarship on Henry VIII has questioned, in varying extents, how ironic the play in totality, including its ending, can be understood in context of how history plays had not fallen out of, out of favor, but merely adapted with shifting trends. While Henry VIII is an oddity among the Shakespearean histories, its chronological place within theatrical trends of the period, Shakespeare's works, and indeed Fletcher's works as well, there is a continuity of themes and structure. Within Shakespeare's works, it fits into trends seen in Pericles, also a collaboration, which demonstrates a looser episodic. Lucas Lamas has recently argued for Macbeth as a history play, which demonstrates variations on the far of generic conventions typically found in Shakespearean English histories. This particular argument of Macbeth as history is compelling, especially in its reinvention of topics and forms. Henry VIII also uses earlier generic conventions and new ways to reinvent and reinvigorate history through an ironic use of previous modes during this time. Topical concerns which are reflected thematically thin the separation between the world of the play and its reception. Continuing from my earlier mention of borrowing, uh, history is often borrowed from other forms. To suit thematic needs. As James's reign progressed, it would be natural that the concerns of history plays under Elizabeth would shift to be relatable to concerns brought by James's reign. This is also significant to see the category with which the first folio uses for history as nearly one example defined as post Norman English history. Other histories were used as sources, whether the rare label of history was applied to them or not in the context of printing Shakespeare's works. Many plays during this period were also called histories on their title pages. Some of these works had little in common with modern understandings of history, or how narrowly the, the definitions of Shakespearean history have dominated scholarly interest in histories. The history play, even narrowly defined in the way in which the first folio folio defines this kind of history, was hardly out of favor, just adapted to new tastes. We have Decker and Webster's famous history of Thomas Wyatt, and even Elizabeth's reign, and he was thinking, no, not me, no, not nobody. Other Jacobian history plays depict Roman history, such as Coriolanus, Antony and Cleopatra, or Britain's mythical past in Sibylline and King Lear. It is worth mentioning that other Henry VIII play of the period, Samuel Raleigh's When You See Me, You Know, which was performed in 1603 printed in 1605, and then reprinted again in 1621. These are just the plays of the print history, which begin to demonstrate how histories and performance in print were still viable markets for the play going and reading public. The variety of history as a source for plays at this time, both within post-Norman English history and without, exposes the decline of the history play's tenuousness, and rather demonstrates how history as a source continues to be dynamically meaningful. The final two points I would like to discuss relate to the two responsible groups compiling the first folio, Shakespeare's Kingsmen colleagues and the stationers holding the printing licenses for his works. While the stationer would have had full responsibility for the printing of the text, 
The noted involvement of Kingsman players also signals its possible value to the Kingsman. As a collaboration between Shakespeare, still the Kingsman senior dramatist, and Fletcher, the next chief dramatist of the company, I would argue Henry VIII's publication within Shakespeare's works helps to demonstrate both the previous and continuing renown of the company's repertory in an environment that was gradually gaining more awareness of authorship. While Shakespeare previously had works published both anonymously and under his name, in this case, the connection between Shakespeare and the King's Men would be familiar to London audience, the target of the graphic portfolio, that an attribution for authorship also suggested the acting company as well. In this mentality, mentioning Fletcher's involvement in the text was somewhat immaterial, as the process of collaboration remained common when Fletcher continued writing plays for the King's Men. Further, the inclusion of Henry McConnell, as well as other powerful patrons, the Herbert Brothers, signals a relationship to the King's Men through Henry McConnell, but also the larger literary scene, which centered around these powerful political and literary patrons. This establishes Shakespeare, his works, and the King's Men as a part of this literary dynasty. The folio's unique strategy of advertising its English histories under this heading, alongside comedy and tragedy, represents in the broader focus of printed plays from this period in an anomaly, but perhaps good marketing sense. As Amy Lister discussed in her 2022 monograph, Publishing the History Play in the Time of Shakespeare, the first folio's categorization of history as a genre represents a particular statement about genre, but one which is hardly hegemonic during this time. In her words, quote, the folio division offers a reading of the plays and its construction reflects the interests and strategies of those who took part in its publication, end quote. Presenting Shakespeare's histories in this form demonstrates how stationer Andrew Wise, the printer of Shakespeare's other English histories, I believe, I believe he held the rights to most of the English histories, uh, guided readers' eyes towards material which he considered commercially valuable and attractive to readers. To return then to my original question, why Henry VIII, the VIII was included, is to say that the play fits within the first folio's definition of history as the reign of a post Norman conquest English king. However, the expected arcs for Shakespearean histories are missing. Thematically, the play deserves rather more attention. It does at least suit a marketing purpose. While the play's distinct differences from other Shakespearean histories can be drawn from its factors as a Jacobean play, as a collaboration, its inclusion signals to the reader essentially that the gang's all here. Andrew Wise has presented histories as his unique draw for readers to now see the full set of English, of Shakespeare's English histories, history plays laid out in order. Considering this category is the only one that exists in this folio, it does represent an attention drawing way of pulling the reader's focus for Wise's speciality. The first folio's publication draws attention to a collaboration from the printing world as well, something which was required to find and collect the printing rates for all the plays included. Because of my own focus on the reading, I find this paralleling collaboration fitting. As the play reflects changing trends and genre expectations alongside traditional collaboration, its inclusion in the folio, as well as the folio's existence, is owed to a group of actors, printers, stationers, and other writers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh... Uh, to our uh, two speakers um, on this examination of the link between collaboration and folio printing, the printed in a folio, and for what reasons, good reasons or bad reasons, <laughs> um, financial reasons or other reasons. So now I invite questions from the audience. Um, there's a microphone here that we can circulate. Uh, Thank you very much for it. Well, making things clearer in a way, but I'd like to mention that, for example, the, well, it's a very minor point, 
But the, fir the first French translation um, by uh, no, um, first translation by Hermès Lapont, French, um, in eighteen sixty-five was under the name of the um, Bachelor. I don't, I, I, I don't know if you mentioned it. Under the name of Fletcher and Shakespeare, or just Fletcher? Yeah, and not as Shakespeare. Just Fletcher? Oh, that's really good. I didn't know that. <laughs> that's super interesting. No, I, I've not, I've not, I didn't know that, and I've not thought about that before. I would have, I thought you were going to say it, it was listed as Fletcher and Shakespeare, and I thought that would have made sense. It's around the time when Fletcher and, and Shakespeare, or the other way around, Shakespeare and Fletcher is beginning to sort of become more the kind of norm and that's partly i think a kind of a fallout of the sort of the kind of <laughs> like the sort of bomb that coleridge threw at the uh going on to the Fletcher canon um and i think it's partly also kind of an increased awareness of, of, of kind of rethinking certain sort of assumptions about about all so i would i would i thought you were going to say it was out of sight as a going on uh, sorry as a Fletcher and shakespeare but that wouldn't have particularly surprised but Fletcher is really interesting i don't know what's going on there maybe there's a sense I mean, I suppose it's a question. Do if, if you want this to be a Shakespeare play or not? It's a question. If you want it to be a Shakespeare play, it's there on the quarto title page, and it is, in fact, a Shakespeare play. If you don't want it to be, and sometimes people don't, well, you can just give it to Fletcher, to Beaumont and Fletcher, throw it in the bin, you can do what you want. So I wonder what's going on there, but I, I have no idea because I, I didn't know it. I ne never, never heard of it. So that's really fascinating. Thank you very much. Um, I've got a question for what you said. <laughs> Do we know what uh, edition was used on the translation? Um, oh, for this translation? Yes, on the French translation. Do we know what was the uh, text? No, no, I mean, the English text used for the French well, translation. I, I only found the information. Hi, hi. Thanks both of you very much. That was they were both really fascinating and I learned a lot. Thank you very much. I wanted to just ask you both of your thoughts about, I think something to do with authorship, really, something that I think came out of both of your talks. If, if we have a story today about authorship, I think part of that story involves the broad sense that modernity has brought with it a kind of flattening towards the single author and a kind of post-romantic investment in the lone figure. And, and one corollary of that perhaps is that prior to the early modernity, actually they're a lot happier and more comfortable with a kind of fluid and recombinant mode of authorship, a collaborative mode, which is something that you both have mentioned. But it seemed to me that in both of your talks, you were picking up on and detecting sort of forms of resistance or problem with collaboration. Or, so we heard, for instance, two noble kinsmen, it's sort of collaborative, it advertises collaborative, but it kind of fails. Naturally, it's awkward. What do you do with it? And Henry VIII, also, it's inherently collaborative. You've shown us there really brilliantly. That kind of falls away from it and goes missing. So I just wondered if either of you had any thoughts about that. Are we right, do you think, to imagine prior to things like the Copyright Act of, what is it, 1710 or something, when in the UK copyright gets enshrined around an author? Are we right to think that early models are wholly comfortable with this kind of collaboration? Am I right to, to detect this? Actually, there's resistance and problems and Collaborations actually maybe are awkward somehow. Thank you. Okay. Um, that's interesting. I think I think we are, we don't know what to do with collaboration now, it seems to me. That that, that seems to be true. And that, that it, it seems a difficulty now. And that one way around it is you just acknowledge that it's collaborative and you don't do anything with it. That, that's one solution. You say, well, it's a collaborative play, but you talk about it as if you talk about any play. And that's that's a kind of trick that I think is sometimes used critically to get around what seems to be a problem. My suspicion is that it was a bit of a problem then. Um, I, I think Fletcher in particular is, is, is being figured in really kind of interesting terms. And 
Well, maybe it's not a problem. I don't know. It, it depends on, on what, what kind of way around. On the one hand, it's not a problem. They're just sort of free. On the other hand, they are clearly mis misattributing all sorts of stuff in all kinds of strange ways. I mean, it's not a model, I think, that we should necessarily seek to emulate. There may be aspects about it, a kind of greater um, sense of kind of a greater willingness to think collaboratively, perhaps. But I think, you know, the, 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 the Beaumont and Fletcher folio is really interesting. I mean, it's sort of really unusual. Mutual. It's not something that's happened previously, and it's not really something that takes off hot since. But they exclude, you know, they, they have to exclude quite a lot. They have to omit the biggest collaboration, which is Fletcher and Massinger, entirely. It doesn't get mentioned, it's not mentioned at all. So, on the one hand, there's a kind of weirdness with collaboration there. We're at a really kind of, I don't know how you do it, and this is a challenge, I guess, for us, because I do think that the Fletcher canon is. is is incredibly important to understanding what the hell was going on in 17th century drama and the publication of 17th century drama. But if you're really comfortable with collaboration and you're trying to print the plays of, of, of Fletcher, I don't think you call it the Beaumont and Fletcher folio. Mm -hmm. I, I just think, and that's right, because you cut out a load of other collaborations, including, including most notably Massinger, but there's field in there, there's other bits and pieces. So I don't know. They've certainly got a different understanding. I think it's freer understanding. Um, and I certainly think that there are problems with our understanding of authorship now, but the, the collaboration does seem to be a kind of difficulty. But I wonder if it is just, not inherently difficult, but it, it just is, is, I wonder if that difficulty is, is present in a different way in the, in the 17th century. That would be my sense, but I don't really know. How about you? Yeah, I feel like my my takeaway from at least the reading that I've done so far is that theater collaboration is something completely different from what happens in, in print. And there's a lot of people that are striving in this time period to, I think, have theater take on more of a, a cultural importance at something like poetry, where that does have kind of single authorship, and but it also has weight in a way that theater does not. Theater is, is in this time period, you know, it's popular entertainment. It's like you go to a comic book for your, you know, criticism. It's not, does not really have the same kind of power as it does in post-restoration uh, England. So then in print, trying to, uh, some people trying to raise the stature of theater to something more like poetry. Um, but also trying to cash in on, in a certain way, if certain authors are becoming popular. Uh, sometimes it seems that you don't necessarily need the author's name attached because people know who wrote it because it's popular in London and, and people are familiar with it. And sometimes you do because then you also know the company that's associated with, the company's author these kinds of things. Um, there was a there's a point that you made. I'm trying to pick up on the again. Mm, that's not. Yeah, no. It's, <laughs> but uh, these are these are almost like they're they're kind of take, they're they're parallel and they're crossing over, but they have almost entirely different ways of of viewing the production of work. You know, I think uh, understanding that plays are are being written in very, very short periods of time because you have to add more place to the repertory to, to cycle in new it, things. Exactly. I think if you think about where authorship really, really matters, it's when you're getting paid. So it matters that Hensler has to pay, I don't know, Robert David or whatever, and, and Massinger thinks, and then he thinks he should get more as much as Massinger, and that kind of thing matters. Does it matter that when he gets the playlist? Do you think we're going to see a Massinger and a Fletcher play or whatever? That seems much less clear. Um, it does matter largely on a, on, a, on a title page. So there are different ways in which it seems to matter and where it doesn't seem to matter. But the way it matters doesn't necessarily accord with the way that it was. Mm -hmm. And that's partly because station, well, all of these people, but stations have to sell stuff. That's what they care about, isn't it? They, if, if it's marketable, if it makes more marketing sense to say something to buy somebody who it lost, then they'll do that. Rather than th their job is not the historian's job of accurately documenting what you know what is actually they, they need to sell the thing. And I think that's partly where where you get those those sorts of issues. And it seems part of what's part of Mosley's reason for doing uh, Bowman's Fletcher at Bowman's Fletcher is because it makes sense for him to do that. He thinks that that's a way that he can sell this book, and that's a different selling point to a different kind of book. And maybe if circumstances have landed differently, he could just hold Fletcher. 
um, you know, or something else. I don't know. So there's there's always that sense of, you know, that that's a kind of tension that I think is is sort of built into the, the, all of this. Yeah, I think there's a couple really interesting examples that I'm I'm half remembering right now, unfortunately, of you know, station or putting somebody else's name on something, and that author going, I didn't write like that. Why are you putting my name on this? <laughs> you have to print a rejection, and they have to issue like a reprint without that author's name. They're like. Action can be a third edition and authors names back. It's not a third edition. Uh, I, I'm trying to there's there's one particular playwright or wildly popular things, and it's always been so I it slips my mind with what you say. Okay, then maybe I'll call and get back to it. Thank you, thank you, buddy. Yes, I, um, I just wanted to, uh, uh, you know, since we're, we're talking about, uh, you know, collaborative writing, um, you know, I, I was wondering if it was a typically English practice at the time, um, you know, because I don't, for example, I, uh, oh, I'm not going to ask you whether this happened in other like, European countries. For example, I don't know, I'm not sure, I remember if there were, this, can I ask you in English whether they were, uh, you know, collaborative uh, writing of drama Estonia again? The, uh, it, you know, because I think it would be interesting to compare. Est-ce qu'on écrit une pièce en collaboration Est-ce qu'il y a des pièces publiées en collaboration Avec d'autres, oui. Je ne sais pas. Non, on vient de ramasser. Je viens de ramasser, je viens de ramasser une pièce. Oui. Des spectacles. Des spectacles. Tu veux dire des spectacles de cours Il y a un travail de merde. Yes, I mean, Shogun was saying yes, it's, uh, in France, for example, it's more about yes, the equivalent of the English mask, for example. But otherwise, it's you know, I find it interesting that it's typically English practice at the time. I mean, I don't know, maybe there are other countries in Europe where this is this is happening as well, but I you know, I wonder if. Yes, as you were suggesting, it has to do with the uh, uh, yes, the organization of the companies. I think that uh, for, for the flexion play, for example, um, the the problem is the poetics of the play that is it's so so alien to um, Shakespeare's writing that. Uh, there's no problem at all, but I don't, I, I don't think of it. any other collaboration between uh, Shakespeare and any other. Any, any other writing? Yeah, there's some. This is a little bit of a broader question, but in 1660, when the plays were divided between, um, you know, the two captains were given, and the plays were divided between uh, Young and the King's men, I was wondering how they might solve the presence of uh, collaboration and leadership. So, for example, I should know this before I have a question, but I don't remember the Beaumont and Fletcher plays were given to the same troop that Shakespeare plays were. And then if there was um, you know, a, a Shakespeare Fletcher collaboration, what troop um, in the initial years after the restoration would have been given the rights to perform that play? Well, that, I mean, two noble kinsmen, sorry. I, I don't think two noble kinsmen really gets much of a performance history from the mid 18th century. But it gets adapted, it is one thing which is common, and it gets adapted by Dabnas as the rivals. So it would be. So it must have been like that. Yeah. 
Um, but um, and going on to Fletcher's stuff, I mean, but all, most of that stuff that we think of as most of the plays in the 1640 folio, right? yeah, almost all of the plays in 1640 folio are King's Men plays. Um, and that's, you know, and again, that's part of the way that it's advertised. It's, it's being advertised that, you know, you've got the kind of signatures of very kinds of um, King's Men. And that's probably because Fletcher sort of essentially succeed Shakespeare in some way or other as being the kind of house dramatist and he works with um Madison during that time and of course Beaumont's dead by then but those some of those like, well they've written a couple of those plays together anyway for the King's Men while Beaumont is alive so a massive chunk of that body of work is uh is King's Men stuff so, so it would have been you know would, would have been formed alongside Shakespeare's plays for you know uh, sort of a long, uh, a long period. Um, and I don't know, is there, is there a sense that part of what's going on here with Shakespeare and Fletcher? This is kind of what I've mentioned in my paper that there's a sense in which they're distinct enough not to be kind of mushed together. And if someone like Wilkins, who cares about John, who the hell is George Wilkins? You know, it's easy to just squeeze him into Shakespeare if you want to see Shakespeare. Um, you can't do that quite easy. You can do it, but it's not as straightforward to do that with somebody like. Fletcher slash Beaumont's Fletcher. Um, and I think, at, at least at that point, obviously this sounds slightly mad now, where you very rarely get to see a, a Fletcher play, and if you do, it'll get all kinds of used to being on sort of the Shakespeare play. But in, in the 17th century, it was a totally different landscape. And Fletcher can broadly conceive is, is you know, a big deal. And some Fletcher plays, I mean, um, uh, Ruler White and Hathaway was a massive hit well into the 19th century, often out of places where I and Fletcher play. It's one of the last plays that Fletcher writes, he writes on his own. So there's that kind of weird legacy too. Um, that's as popular as almost any revived play for several centuries. Um, again, usually most tributes. So there are odd things going on, and part of what we've got to kind of get to is this sense that our understanding of Fletcher's broad and Fletcher and Poe's importance and significance is, is really out of kilter with the kind of status that he, that he and his collaborators had in them, or he in particular, he and Beaumont had in the, in the, in the 17th century. And that's a kind of weirdness um, that's quite difficult to sort of undo. <laughs> One last question. Oh, I've already said them. No, 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 it's actually just a quick thought, really, which was just that um, he showed us on the title page of the yeah, yeah. Two Noble Kingston, and we've got that joint, that fascinating description, John, John Fletcher and William Shakespeare. And you, at the start of your talk, you, you thought a little bit about some of the reasons that have been put forward by modern editors of Shakespeare that this play was excluded from the first folio. And actually, this title page is quite loud in that thinking. And you, you suggested that. Look, I mean, here it is. Maybe this is. Now, there are problems there, as you mentioned, because there are lots of other collaborative plays. And I, I just wanted, I guess, to notice, I suppose, I, I think our, our, our easy habits there is a view of history with the Bode and Leo at the center of it. So there's something that's happened with time there, isn't there? As if that this play has been dragged back 20 years with this title page. And as if to say, those who constructed the folio looked at this title page and thought, hmm, it's impossible. Yes. So I just wanted to suggest the thought there might be something like the folio sort of distort is a problem going forwards. And actually, the folio might have made this title page yeah. by virtue of the exclusionary problems. If you make something afterwards, you sort of got to navigate or address somehow, resolve the fact that you weren't in this thing. Right. Yeah. And this might be a strategy yeah. that's actually generated. So rather than being a rationale for, it might be a consequence of. I, I, I think that that chance might be too. And I think that there is a sort of strange sense in which that is being induced with evidence for their exclusion. But I'm saying maybe, maybe if it's if it's, a, if it's well known to be a really explicitly collaborative play for some reason, then that, that might be a factor. But this, this is, like you say, it's after both. It's not the first two million. And once that comes, and, and so yeah, maybe that's part of the rationale. If you do it as just a, you know, um that, that becomes part of the rationale for then how you sort of advertise it. And once it's gone in print, it also becomes a rationale for how would people once you've got it down, um, 
people have to respond to it in some way. They can ignore it, they can reject it, but you, you, it's known they don't feel it before you accept it. And that's some of the things that, that, that happen at various points. And we get these weird things in the 18th century where 18th century editors of Shakespeare, they keep going, well, let's get to Shakespeare and, 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 and Fletcher there because but we're not going to do anything with it because there's also another tradition where it doesn't belong in it. So, and, 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 and I think that's partly what the book was kind of going on. Once it's into a button, I think at least, it becomes something that has to be negotiated. And particularly so with folios, um, you know, it's, it's kind of a set of aggressive being in this conference, is that folios are big canonizing side events. And once they're in there, it's not that they can't go out, but there's, there's a bit of an issue. And if you left out of one and you're included in another, that's going to have some sort of effect. That's not something that's kind of straightforwardly easily kind of um, uh, negotiated. But yeah, what, what you said, I think, says better and fuller <laughs> than I was able to what I'm kind of think. I think that's right. I think it's a slight problem with the collaborative sort of system kind of the arguments, although I don't think it's totally wrong. I, I think that that is a slight sort of um, strange handful of things like that. Yes. Thank you. So, um, thanks again to our two first uh, two speakers. Um, <laughs> and now we move on to something else. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Ben.